anything can happen when the Lord is near. Jesus is here. Anything can happen. Anything can happen when the Lord, he is within us. Moving all about us. Anything can happen when the Lord is here. Are you glad Jesus is here tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then Romans 5 and then Romans 6. Hallelujah. That sounds good. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 45. Everybody glad to be living for the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. And so it is written, the first man, Adam. Everybody say the first man, Adam. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, sometimes you'll hear that in preaching, you'll hear that referred to as the second Adam. Scripture says the first man, Adam, and the last man, or the last Adam, was made a quickening spirit. The first man, Adam, was Adam. The second man, Adam, was Jesus Christ. Howbeit, that was not the first which was spiritual. The first man, Adam, was not the spiritual Adam, but that which is natural. The first man, Adam, was the natural Adam. And after that, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Boy, you talk about a one God verse right there. The second man, Adam, is Jesus. And Jesus is the Lord from heaven. I didn't say it. Paul said it. If you don't like that, fight with Paul. As the earthy, verse 48, as is the earthy, so such are they also that are earthy. So he's making a distinction. The first man, Adam, is earthy. The last man, Adam, is heavenly. And those that are earthy are as is the earthy, so are those that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. In other words, there's a difference between those that are still of their father Adam and those that are of the last man Adam. Verse 49, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, we're made in the image of our father Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Uh, there's something about, there's a whole discussion, maybe we'll preach about it one of these days, about being a primary person a principal person. Um, Adam was a principal person. Eve was a principal person. What we mean by that, primary, they are first. And the decisions that they make go for everybody. So he says, for as by one man's disobedience, men, many were made sinners. Adam disobeyed and we're all born in sin. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, when the law came, we knew the difference between that which was clean and that which was unclean, that which was pure and that which was impure, that which was righteous and that which was sinful. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Praise God. That as sin hath reigned unto 
death. Everybody say reigned unto death. Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. One chapter more. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin, everybody say dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Are you thankful that you've got the newness of life tonight? Are you thankful you got the Holy Ghost? Are you thankful you've been buried in Jesus' name? Hallelujah, hallelujah. I, I don't know how this is going to be tonight. I don't know if this is teaching or preaching. When I, when I set out to teach, I end up preaching and when I set out to preach, I just end up preaching. Whatever I do, will you do it with me tonight? Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, God, I love you. Thank you so much for your spirit. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your glory. Thank you, God, for allowing us to come into your house and into your presence. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In Jesus' name, would you pray with a loud voice with me for just a moment? Come on, church, let's pray. Let's put forth some energy into the Holy Ghost tonight. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Here we are, God. We're in your presence wanting to hear from you. We need you. We've got to have you. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, if you can, would you just let this house be filled with a hand clap of praise unto God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I, I, sometimes I do okay with titles. Most of the time I don't. Tonight's one of those don't nights. So we're going to try to make the connection between baptism into Jesus Christ and Christian decision making. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Hallelujah. Lord bless you. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I'm glad that I don't live the way I used to live. Hallelujah. I'm not sure where the statistic comes from, but in reading an article, uh, it was, it's an interdenominational group that publishes this and in they gave out a list of statistics, and I, I'm not sure. Um, probably a little digging would have given me all of that information. I'm not sure where they get this statistic from, but they say that the average adult makes 70 conscious decisions every day. Uh, that means we make about, uh, we make a decision on average um, about four times every hour, or about once every 15 minutes we make a decision. On the bad days, it feels like we're having to make three decisions every minute. Hallelujah. And we make a decision, do I want to eat uh, Pop-Tarts or do I want to eat bacon? Or do I want to eat it all? Um, do I want to hit snooze? See, those decisions creep up on you before you're even conscious. Do I want to hit snooze and sleep for nine minutes or seven minutes? Or do I want to hit snooze twice and sleep for 18 minutes longer and get up and just be in a rush? Most of the time I hit snooze. That's why my alarm starts going off at a quarter to six in the morning. That way I can hit snooze at least three times or four. Hallelujah. I don't know what that says about me. If that means I've got bad character, well, just pray for me. But we make all of these decisions. We make all of these decisions. Sometimes our stress is high because we're making decisions and sometimes the decisions are the, the right decision is apparent 
and we're able to make them with ease and we have relatively comfortable days. But nonetheless, you are making, uh, according to this statistic, you are making about four decisions uh, an hour. Uh, and one of the decisions that we make uh, that's, that's a little more weighty than just deciding what we're going to eat or what we're going to wear or what we're going to do for enjoyment, one of the decisions that we made, this is the preaching part of the teaching right here, one of the decisions that we made was to come to the house of God tonight and give God high praise. Hallelujah. When you got here, you had another decision to make. Yeah, you had to decide whether or not I'm going to worship the Lord kind of or I'm going to worship the Lord for real. I hope you made a decision. I'm going to worship God, body, soul, and spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may have plantar fasciitis in your right foot, but don't let your right foot keep the rest of your body from worshiping him. You may have had a headache all day long, but don't let the headache keep the rest of you from worshiping him. Worship it. This is a decision that you have to make. Nothing else, nothing could keep you from worshiping God. It's a decision that we all made. We're going to come to the house of God and give him praise. And man, we've got something to worship him about. He's picked us up. He turned us around. He's washed us off. All of the gunk and the junk and the muck and the mire and the mud and the, all the crud, all of that. Boy, we're just finding words that rhyme that there. But God washed it all away. And we're a part of a great kingdom and we're a part of revival. We've got reasons. We've got reasons to make a decision to worship him. Yeah. And, and, and revival's happening. Just, just, Robert, I know we didn't plan this. Just tell them what happened to church on, uh, in Jasper. Uh, so preaching Jasper, normal service. We had 19, yeah. which is, yeah. that's good. And uh, we did a Mother's Day tribute service. At the end, I called all the ladies down. They, listen, they don't really stand up. They don't clap. There's not a whole lot of, there is no music really. Um, my kids, Colson, got to play a song, and my wife and kids sang. And that was his first time to do it. And somebody got the Holy Ghost at the end of church. We had everybody come down and pray, and we got done. And Terry come up to me. He said, hey, he said, something just happened to me. I started shaking all over. I couldn't contain it. It was coming out of me. That's revival. I think that ought to inspire you to make a decision to give God praise. What a great God we serve. What a great open door he's given us. What revival we're having. Hallelujah. Somebody give him praise. Somebody give him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's a pretty good reason to worship God. Hallelujah. This is, but worship's our decision. Worship's a decision. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you came to the house of God tonight, nobody compelled you to worship God. We have microphones, uh, but we don't, have, we don't have a ball and chain that says if you don't worship God, we're going to chain you to a pipe in the crawl space. <laughs> if you don't worship God, we're going to come and flick you on the top of the ear. Uh, we didn't pick on anybody. We didn't get you in a headlock. We didn't threaten you. We didn't bully you. We didn't cajole you. Now, there is a difference. As a preacher, as a service leader, we've got a job to do. And that is, no, we can't just let the people of God sit there and everything that happened all on Monday and Tuesday. No, when you come in the house of God, that's our job. That's your job is to come in here and break chains. And it, it's like a big spiritual bulldozer. It's like a caterpillar. And we're pushing back all of that junk so that you can worship God. But we worship God. The Lord tonight according to our own decisions it's our decision when you see us running the aisles it's our decision we don't pull numbers and the number tonight says uh, brother Will Romero is supposed to run the aisles on the second song and that's what his little we don't have little cue cards that says no uh, the sister Elena Romero she's going to get out on the first song and start dancing in the aisle we don't have anything like that it's our decision I, I know this is simple preaching simple teaching tonight it's our decision by the way this stretches not just into our worship but we're not living for God because this is some set of rules or regulations we've made a decision that we love him we've made a decision that our whole life is built around pleasing him. 
And so we worship the Lord in the good times. And we worship the Lord in the bad times. It's our decision. We worship him when we understand his ways. And we worship him when his ways are past finding out. We worship in rejoicing and we worship in times of trouble. It's, it's, a, it's a mature Christian that understands when good things happen to me, that's cause to get out in the aisle and give God praise. And when bad things happen to me and I don't know what else to do, the thing to do is to get a hold of God in worship. It's a decision. It's a decision. Have you decided to worship him tonight? Have you made a decision for God today? Hallelujah. Let's give him praise. Hallelujah. Now let me stop for just a second and make this a little further connection between worship and decision making. Uh, and there's a lot to preach about when you consider worship. But let's just cover, instead of trying to cover a lot of it, let's just cover this sliver of it tonight. There's a direct link, as we've already been preaching about, between decision making and worship. Um, a direct link between decision making and worship. Let me say that again so that we can begin to digest it a little bit. There is a connection that is inseparable between my worship and my decision making. Uh, this is what we mean. What you worship, here, here's what you worship. Now, before I, a lot of times we consider worship, and it is. We consider worship getting out in the aisle and running or shouting or dancing. And thank God we don't go to a dead church. Um, a lot of times we relegate worship to what we do in the prayer room, what we do in the altar, hands lifted, tears flowing, voices crying out, and that is, that's a part of worship. But worship, the thing that you worship, everybody say, the thing that I worship. The thing that I worship is not necessarily the thing that I'm feeling right now. I think you know where I'm going, but I'm not. Stay with me. The thing that I worship is the thing that controls my decision making. The thing that controls my... I can come in here and run the aisles. And, it, it, and that's good. And yet, God not really be the thing that's controlling my decision making. Let me say it this way. It's possible to praise God, but never worship Him. Uh, scripture talks about praising God uh, is something that occurs in the natural order of creation. Scripture talks about the trees of the field clapping their hands. I thank God that we have boisterous praise, high volume praise high intensity praise but I don't want to just be a praising church I want to be a church that God controls our I want I want to be a worshiping church I want to be a worshiping man you want to be a worshiping woman and it's possible to praise God but never worship him uh, maybe we could say it this way, and, and you'll understand that this is not a full concept, but this is the way we're talking about it tonight. Uh, praise can happen because we have a feeling. And that's good. But worship has to go well past a feeling. Here we go. Worship requires a master. Boy, that's, a, that's one of those things that, when you preach about people having a master, that it causes the world to bow up, if you can say bow up from the pulpit. Well, I mean, we've said other things from the pulpit, so. <laughs> Sometimes you just, it just happens. Anyway. Um, 
But when you talk about people having a master, because the idea of being mastered has such a, a negative connotation to it in this present society that the idea of having any master. And so teenagers will say, I'm tired of my mom and dad telling me what to do. I'm going to go join the Navy. Okay. Um, I'm sick of all these rules. I'm going to go get me a job at McDonald's where I don't have to listen to anybody. Uh, but they have standards at McDonald's. And, and you're going to have a master. And that master's going to control your time. And you're, they're going to tell you what to do with it and your decisions. Uh, so praise can require a feeling, but worship requires a master. One of the best examples of this in Scripture is the woman in Matthew 15 whose daughter was grievously vexed with a devil. I started to preach about this. Well, maybe I did preach about this on Sunday. She had no embarrassment, and she didn't care how bad she embarrassed her daughter. Mom, don't tell everybody I've got a devil. But she did, and she came to the, to the disciples. She came to the disciples, and the disciples couldn't do anything about it. And they tried to send her away, and finally Jesus shows up, or maybe she sees him for the first time, and she comes to him. She's a Gentile, and she comes to him, and she says, Master, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, and Jesus says to her, I didn't come to give that which belongs to the children to dogs. I didn't come to give the bread to, to dogs. Now, I'd have probably went and found another person to worship at that point if he called me a dog. But Scripture says this, that she came to him and worshiped him. See, this is okay. All right. All right. I can't think of anything that would rob me of, of affectionate feelings for somebody. Because it wasn't just her. It was her daughter that he called a dog. I can't think of anything that would rob me of feelings that would make me want to worship somebody than for them to call me and my child a dog. I'm probably, if I am, a, boy, this is the end of the sermon here. If I'm living according to the first man, Adam, if you call me and my child a dog, I'm gone. We'll find somebody else. But that's not what happened. This woman makes a decision. It's not based on a feeling. It's not based on how fuzzy I feel right now. It's not based on a promise that you gave me across the pulpit. I made a decision. Call me a dog if you will. You're the only one that's got an answer, and you're the only one that's worthy of worship. It's not based on how I feel right now. It's based on a decision that I understand you, who you are. Come on, I think we ought to make a decision and give him praise for a moment. Scripture says she came and worshipped him. It's the Greek word. It comes from the Greek word prosuke. Uh, worship. Worship. It's, it's, also, it's also where we get the word prayer. Uh, it, it, it's, it means to bow down. It means to bow down. Uh, it means to lay down on your face where the front of the human being is laid down on the ground in worship and in adoration. Stay with me. Stay with me. This is why this is so incredible. It literally means one of the examples that is used theologically. It's like a dog that comes and licks its master's hand. This is what worship means. Whatever you tell me to do, that's what I'm going to do. My, my family and I went yesterday. We, we, got a, we got a bird dog. When we got him, he was, I don't know what got on our brains 
to get so many dogs, but now we can't get rid of them. And we got him when he was little. Ken, we got him when he was little. He was little and he was cute and he was fuzzy. And Well, now he can come put his chin on the table and wait for you to give him a bite. But we went. He's at, the, he's at college right now. We sent him to college, and uh, they're teaching him obedience right now. And so, so we went, and uh, the guy was showing us, his name was Logan. Logan was showing us how they training him. And he's got this lead, and there's certain commands. We got out there, and he's, he's got all this hair on him, and he's, the first thing that happened when we got out there, he's sitting in the driveway waiting on us to pull up and come see him. And uh, we're all excited about him. And one of the first things he does is he gets up and he runs over there and they've got a little box of pigeons in the driveway. Stay with me. We're going somewhere. It might take us a while to get there, but we're going. And the first thing he does is he want to go over there and smell those pigeons. But we're not smelling pigeons right now. This is not recess. And this is not... Sp- pigeon smelling time and so what has to happen is the master has to speak Ozzy here and we have to go get that lead because you don't get to just do whatever you want I'm the master and so we got Ozzy and we walked up and down the yard and when we want him to go this way we say here and we give him not not a hard one but just a little tug on that and, and he lines up And you want him to be about that far from your left leg. And when you stop, you want him to stop. And when you say sit, he's supposed to sit. And he's not supposed to get up until you say here. And so he's supposed to stay there. And if he gets up, you're supposed to take that lead and say sit. This is what's supposed to happen. Boy, this is aggravating for us Christians. This insults our intelligence. This insults our our sense of self. But Jesus is the master. Listen, I know this is simple preaching, but when he says stand, I stand. When he says sit, I sit. When he says come, I come. When he says go, I go. That's worship. I'm not making a, I'm making a decision to not follow the dictates of the first man, Adam, that I was born into, but I'm making a decision to follow my master. Now, lest you think that this is some kind of cultic deal I've never lived so good as living in the house of my master I've got peace that I never had before I've got joy that I never had before I've got comfort that I never had before I'm not sleeping in the rain how many are thankful that you don't live according to the master that that you used to live under but you live under the master's rule the man named Jesus Christ So this is, we'll get back to the part we were preaching about. When she's called a dog, she's there for her daughter. So it's not just her being called a dog, it's her daughter being called a dog. I didn't come to give that which belongs to the lost sheep of Israel. I didn't come to give that to dogs. She has to make a decision. Can I just stop and tell you for just a second? This preaching stuff goes on in the room. Uh, it, it, it gets, it gets um, well, it gets, um, don't tell anybody, but it gets, it gets straight. Um, it gets, it gets kind of chippy. Uh, it gets hot. If you sit on the front row, it gets kind of spitty. And here's the word I've been trying to avoid all sentence long. It gets offensive. Because one of these days we're going to get up and we're going to preach about your pet deal. Your pet sin. See, see I'm trying to soften it. We're going to get up and we're going to preach about your pet sin. 
And it may even go like this. Well, I, I, I don't consider that a sin. The question isn't whether you consider it a sin. The question is whether or not you can make a decision to have a master. And I'm not talking about the preacher. I'm talking about the word of God. So this is where we're at. Woo. See, now, now this is the deal. I've heard some people say we, we've talked about standards and things like that. And I'm not preaching standards tonight, but we're not scared of nothing either. But I've heard, I've heard people say, well, well, what you need to do is just let the Lord convict you of such and such. Well, yeah, yeah, you, you do need to let the Lord convict you. Um, but after a while, I'm going to convict you of it. <laughs> I'm the man of God around here. That's my job. And, and see, some of you got tight on me right there. Well, since we tight, let's just wait out there in it. There's a reason why we don't have televisions in our home because that becomes a what you watch, what you observe begins to control your decisions. You want to dress like them? You want to walk like them? You want to talk like them? You want to go to their stuff? And you want, no, but we're not yielded to that master. We're not giving in to that master. That's not our Hollywood is not our master. Jesus is our master. And we don't watch it on our cell phones. And we don't watch it on our tablets. Amen. See? Hallelujah. Where were we at? It's decisions. Everybody, we'll just, we'll just jump to that part. Say, I, I've got to make a decision. I believe it was Bishop Booker. If it wasn't Brother Booker, I'm giving him credit, and I'll correct it if need be. But I believe it was Bishop Booker that preached a sermon like this, where he said, to this effect... In the sermon, we make our decisions, and our decisions make us. Let me say that again. We make our decisions, and our decisions make us. Let me get that a little more personal. I, you, I make my decisions, you make your decisions, and our decisions make us. And when we make a decision in a godly direction... That one decision gives us the ability to make another decision. Me and Sister Nancy are trying to do carnivore. Carnivore diet. We're not chasing things down and killing it and ripping it up with our teeth. I don't guess, or you do. I'm not. <laughs> That would be fun, though. And uh, I'm not a big vegetable kind of guy. Um, I, I like steak. Given the choice between a steak and a green bean, it's steak every time. Given the choice between chicken and broccoli, chicken every time. Bacon every time. Sausage every time. You know what I'm talking about here. But since I started carnivore diet, I've never wanted carrots so bad in my life. I've Brussels sprouts. Mmm. Cauliflower. I've never wanted a salad so bad in my life. And, and it, that goes without saying all the little snack deals, and especially the sweet ones. And Snickers, the best combination in the world is Snickers and Doritos, red Doritos. Blue Doritos are imposters, impersonators. <laughs> Zach, there's really only one kind of Dorito. Everything else is a bad imitation. Good grief. Somebody said blue. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, that used to be when you're golfing or you're driving down the road. So when you're driving, the best combination is ranch, sunflower seeds, and sweet tarts, are, uh, the ones in the roll, the crunchy ones.
We're going somewhere. Stay with me. This may, this may go off the rails tonight. I don't know if we're going to have an altar call or if we're all just going to high five and leave. <laughs> And I, wanted, I want those things. And I'm used to having those things. And it's awful. The first day, Brother Wells, I got up and I had bacon, eggs, and sausage. Carnivore diet. And I wanted something else. All of those things we just talked about. But that one decision... After my hunger was satiated, that one decision gave me the ability to make a better decision for lunch. But if I had skipped breakfast, by the time I got to lunch, without question, Hershey Bar, Mountain Dew, and barbecue Lay's. Sounds awful, doesn't it? That's how we get in the shape that we're in. But breakfast, that decision gave me the ability to make a better decision at lunch. And it gave me the ability to make a better decision at dinner. And so four, five, six days later, ten days later, two months later, we're able to make a better decision because of that first one. Because we make our decisions and our decisions make us. This is what that looks like. So when I make one step toward God, it makes it easier to make the next step toward God. What are you talking about? Just coming to the house of God is making a decision for God. But when I get here and I get used to the way things flow, coming to the house of God gives me the ability to lift my hands in the presence of God. Lifting my hands in the presence of God gives me the ability to raise my voice in the presence of God. I wish somebody would make a decision for God right now. Could you just make a simple decision? Let's give God great praise for just a moment. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is this all right tonight? That's good because this is all we've got. Hallelujah. We have in our background, in our scriptural background, we have people who are our examples of good decision making. People that the decisions that they were making were far greater. That their decisions were made in the face of peril. Their decisions were made in the midst of hazard. And they made their they made their decision in the midst of circumstance that is for us thankfully unthinkable. And yet they decided my decisions will not be dictated by my feelings, my, my decisions will not be dictated by my circumstances. Boy, let me stop for just a second. You know, there are people under the sound of my voice who have gone through unspeakable things sitting in this room. Some of them I've had conversations with and some of them I'm just aware just because it's been expressed and it, I'm aware. Things that they don't want to talk about. Unspeakable things. And this sounds cold and I don't mean it cold. I mean it for your edification. You have to decide not to be a victim. You have to decide, even if you've been a victim, to not be a victim. I will not live like a victim. 
and there are people that have made a decision to live that way and their entire existence is based off of it's based off of it's based off of I'm trying to be careful with this it's based off of getting a handout and if I'm not a victim I don't get that hear me and everybody needs help that's not what we're saying this church has helped a lot of people and we're going to help a lot more by the grace of God every way body soul and spirit we're going to help them by giving them the Holy Ghost we're going to help them by with money we're going to, I, I believe one of these days we're going to have the ability to help people get houses and, and please but people that buy into being a victim live a life of utter defeat you have to decide I am not going to stay. This may have happened to me. They may have done it. It's awful. I can't do anything about it. We can't go back in time and erase it. We would if we could. But I'm going to tell you, the future doesn't have to look like the past. All you've got to do is make a decision. I'm not living according to my circumstances. I'm not living according to the abuse that I... I'm not living according to that... I'm not living according to what my dad, what my mom, I'm not living according to those things. That's not my master. I will not worship those things. Brother Bob Sattler, hear me. I'm talking about worship and decision making. Brother Bob Sattler, as it kind of became apparent, Toward the end, we had a conversation. And I could tell, he called me. I was, I was on my way to Birmingham, and I pulled over. I pulled over at the Dodge City exit and sat at the truck stop there. And we talked. And you can tell when the Holy Ghost begins to help you. How many of you ever felt the Holy Ghost begin to help you as you, you were talking? And he said, Pastor, I don't know what to do. He wasn't wimping out. It, this, he wasn't yellow. He just didn't know what to do. And I remember we had a conversation 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and all of a sudden I felt the Holy Ghost prompt. I said, Brother Sattler, I said, I want you to listen to me. What cancer wants to do is it wants to become your God. It wants to become the thing that you worship. Where every decision that you make is based on the fact that you've got it. I said, but I said, I can't, I wish God had given me a magic wand when he called me to preach, but he didn't. I'd use it every time. I, I'd overdraft with my magic wand. I'd use it every time. But I'm going to tell you, God had confidence in that man. And, God got, and God's got confidence in you. And God's got confidence in your neighbor and in your brother and in your sister. <sighs> and we begin to talk about that. I said, what it wants to do is control every decision that you make. It wants to control how you eat. It wants to control whether you sleep good or not. It wants to control how your family life goes. It wants to control where you go and where you don't go. I said, you can't. I understand that it's a serious thing, and we're not trying to diminish how serious that situation was. But look at what a man can do when he decides, I will not worship that thing. I will worship God. And I remember him coming to the house of God. And as long as I can remember him giving God praise and worshiping him. Listen, I don't know what you're going through. And it's a serious deal. And it's a big deal. Don't give in to it. Don't worship it. Don't let that control your decisions. Make a decision to worship God. Right now, why don't we just make a decision? Why don't you just make a decision right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Three Hebrew children. Boy, until you get here, we preached this before, until you get to this point, you never know peace 
until you get to the point where you're facing fire. And the command is you bow down. When you hear the worship or when you hear the music, you bow down and worship. I like the courage of those, what we call those three Hebrew children. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's their Babylonian names. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's their real names. Oh, by the way, you may have a name where you work in Babylon, but your real name has a Hebrew name. They may know you as Cletus Fitzgerald, the top salesman, but that's not really your name. That's your undercover agent name. I like their courage. Heat the, heat the furnace up seven times hotter. It's already hot enough to kill you. Heat it up seven times hotter. I love their courage. You'll never know peace until you get here. If you don't bow down and worship, when you hear the music, we're going to throw you in. And they just watched it kill the guards. And he said, King, we're not even careful. We don't even have to deliberate. We don't need 20 minutes to talk it over. We're not even careful to answer you in this matter. For our God is well able to deliver us. We're not going to worship an idol that looks like a man. We know we were worshiping the one true God when we walked up here, and we'll worship the one true God whether he delivers us or not. We're not even careful to answer you because God's well able to deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. Job, this is what she said. You're sitting there in ashes. You've got boils from head to toe. And he's scraping himself with pottery. He's scraping himself with pottery. He's suffering. His friends are there and they are no comfort. He's lost his house. He's lost his children. He's lost everything. Everything's gone. God, let it happen. I'm just letting that one sit there for a minute. God, let it happen. And she says, his wife says, Job, curse God and die. And the two decisions are there in front of him. Victim, Oh, yeah, if anybody could claim being a victim. The two decisions are there in front of you. Curse God and die. And there's no deliberation. Job says this. You talk like a foolish woman. Though he slay me. Notice, not just if I die, even though I die, it's even though he kills me. That's what slay means. If he's the reason that I die, I'm still not going to, I'm still going to trust him. I'm still going to worship him. Comes down to a decision. Comes down to a decision. Here's the, here's the thing. Listen, boy, we're jumping all over this at the end. Here's the thing with bitterness. Here's the thing with being injured. Here's the thing with being wounded in spirit by somebody's words or somebody's actions. Here's the thing. It almost always makes sense. It's almost always, if, if somebody hears your story, they almost always can go, yeah, I, I, I see what you're talking about. But it doesn't matter. It'll kill you. It'll destroy you. It'll maim you forever. It'll, it'll, it'll cost you eternity. And so you've got to decide You've got to decide in the face 
of God calling me a dog? In the face of, I don't know if he's going to deliver me or not. In the face of, he might be the reason that I die. That preacher was mean at Cornerstone, and I am. My wife is fixing me, though. You got to decide. You, you've got to decide. And that's what's going on in this room right now. That's what's going on in this room right now. Now, listen, I didn't get to the end of this. I'm at the end of page two. You've got to decide. S sit down for just a second, guys. Give me, give me five minutes. You've got to decide if you're going to make decisions according to your flesh. If you're going to make decisions according to the first man, Adam, under which we were all born. Paul said we were all earthy the way Adam was earthy. You got to decide if you're going to make decisions according to the earthy or if you're going to make decisions according to the heavenly. Let me just jump to the end of the sermon tonight. You need to make your decision not according to the earth, but according to the heavens. And how do I make my decision according to the heavens? You've got to go back and get in touch with that man or that woman that was buried in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. Uh, we didn't have time to get to this. We preached longer than we thought we were going to preach tonight. You've got to go back. And you've got to get in touch with that man or that woman that first came up out of that water and were completely brand new. Boy, let me talk to you about Jesus' name baptism for just a second. Baptism in Jesus' name is twofold. Baptism in Jesus' name is twofold. It takes care of things in a twofold way. Baptism in Jesus' name takes care of things in a twofold way. Number one, you go down in that water buried in Jesus' name for the sins that you committed as a man, as a woman. We go down, when we go down in that water, let me preach some hope to you for just a moment. When you go down in that water, adultery is washed away. When you go down in that water, fornication is washed away. Drug habits are washed away. Filthy and licentious living is washed away. You're buried in the name of Jesus for the sins that you've committed. But the twofold nature of baptism is it's not just, it doesn't just wash away the sins that I committed, but it changed, it washed away the sins of my Adam nature. Theologians would call that your Adamic nature. It washed away the sins of my Adamic nature. Meaning, if I never committed a sin, I was born in sin because I'm the son of Adam. I'm a son, I'm the son of that earthy man named Adam, the first man Adam. I'm his son. You're his son. You're his daughter. But when I went down in the waters of baptism, I came up not under the first man Adam, but I came up under the last man Adam, the man Jesus Christ. And that man who was perfect in every way, went to Calvary and made a decision. Not my will, but thine be done. I don't have time to get to all of this. I don't have time to get to all of this. Christian decision making comes back to going, uh, come, comes down to going all the way back to that foundational decision that you made on the night that God saved you and filled you with his spirit and we buried you in his name. And your nature was changed. Oh, boy, we don't have the time to get to it. Let me just use the words that's at the very end of our text tonight. When you get up out of the waters of baptism, you're a new man. You're a new woman. And your old things are passed away. And now you walk around in the newness of life. Newness of life. That doesn't mean second chance. Jesus didn't give us a second chance. He gave us a new kind of life. It's not like 
It's not like we took the test for the wells and we failed the test. And Jesus, God said, here, here's a second chance at passing the test. No, he didn't just give us a test and we failed the test. And now we get a second shot at the test. He gave us the answers to the test. When you get to this, here's the answer. When you get to this, I'm the answer. When you get to this, I'm the answer. When you have to make this decision, don't make it according to your flesh. Make it according to your heavenly nature. Now, the Holy Ghost is in this room tonight. It's in this room tonight. And he's calling somebody. He's calling somebody. I couldn't get away from this today. I even tried. I was almost done with another sermon. And I thought, no, no, I'm going to preach that one. The Holy Ghost is calling for somebody tonight. The Holy Ghost is calling for you to abandon, to abandon things that you worship. Boy, see, that gets pointed right there. You have to abandon all of those things that controlled your decisions. Listen, I'm not talking about you got strep throat. Don't come if you don't have strep throat. If you have strep throat. Don't come if you got COVID. Don't come if you got flu. Stay home. Text me and let me know. That's all you got to do. It's not what I'm talking about. We don't want anybody's stomach issues. That's not what I'm talking about. Go on vacation with your family. That's not what I'm talking about. But don't let anything keep you out of the house of God. Make a decision to come to the house of God. Make a decision to come to prayer night. Make a decision to come to midweek. Make a decision. Make a decision. Make a decision. When I wake up in the morning, I'm going to praise him. When I lay down at night, I'm going to worship him. He controls my decisions. Could we stand to our feet all over this house? And let's lift our voice. Let's make a decision to love him. Come on, with a loud voice. Can you do it? All over this house, make a decision. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Worship you in the truth. This altar's open. You need to come tonight. We worship you in the spirit. We worship you. Worship you in. We worship you in the spirit. That's what we long. That's what we. I want you to make a decision right here. I want you to make a decision. 
I, I, this is another sermon, and I, I'm not preaching it. I'm going to make the point. You have to make a decision every time you come to the house of God to be a minister. This is another sermon. As you minister, your need gets met as you minister. When you make a decision for him, when you make a decision to minister, God begins to work in supernatural ways. This is it. We're not, we're not preaching another one here. But God begins to do things that you didn't think could be done as you begin to minister. So this is what we're going to do. I want you to make a decision. Well, I, I don't like to go and pray for somebody unless I feel it. Well, not, let's not base it on feelings. Let's base it on a decision. Why don't you, they're going to play and sing it again. I want you to make a decision. Go and find somebody. Go and find somebody that you don't normally pray with. Put your arm around them. Take them by the hand. Pray for them. Here we go. They're going to sing it. Into we, we worship you in. 